Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are joining. Um, well, I'm joining from California, and my friend Pratyus is joining from New Jersey. We have Professor Kiroella from Colombo, and uh, yeah, participants from Australia and other parts of the world. Um, we have people joining live on Facebook, and we want to welcome you all to our second. Good uh, night. This is on the ground. Hmm? Second series on the foreign policy series. Yes. So welcome all to the second series of the foreign policy topic, uh, which is you know organized by policy.lk. And we have a very um, very timely topic today. What next for US and South Asia choices? Um, so put, put things in context, let me make a small introduction before we go to our speaker. Um, you know, as you are all aware, we just had a presidential election in the United States. And I think it's safe to say that um, the next administration after January 2021 will be a Biden-Harris administration. So President-elect Biden has come in. And uh, when it comes to foreign foreign policy, Democrats have a particular style of foreign policy as opposed to a Republican administration. There are different values historically that Democratic administration has tried to promote across the world. And uh, many of us are wondering what it means for South Asia and what does it mean for Sri Lanka? To answer your, all your questions, we have with us a, an old colleague of mine, <laughs> Um, he's a former journalist and a concerned South Asian. Uh, he's a colleague of mine from Washington, D.C., when uh, we met during our master's in D.C. Uh, so without um, keeping you any longer, welcome to the show, Pratush. And thank you. Thank you for um, accepting our humble invitation to join the show. Um, let me just put you, take you straight away to the deep, deep end of the waters. Uh, so, Pratish, how do you think U.S. foreign policy uh, will be different with a Biden administration in the future? Over to you. Yeah, so um, thank you for having me here, Tisra. I mean, it's, it's a pleasure, it's an honor. And, uh, you know, when Tisra approached, it is, it is quite, um, it, I mean, it's very topical right now to discuss uh, what's happening with the Biden administration. And I, I really think that the major difference between Trump and Biden will be on policies related to multilateralism and climate change. I mean, these are the main areas where Trumpism failed and Trump's decision to withdraw from the WHO or the UN Human Rights Commission or even a threat to withdraw from NATO or the Paris Agreement. Now, some, if not all, are issues that the Biden administration has clearly indicated that they will change the US position on. So that is where it's likely to differ. But on other issues, and, and uh, and no one really, you know, crystal ball gazing is a very dangerous uh, activity, but there are issues where there's likely to be greater con continuity between Trump and Biden, for example, on China. So Biden is unlikely to adopt a softer approach. Trump's foreign policy approach was definitely less delicate than those of his predecessors, but he kind of aggressively pursued the same agenda. Um, you know, this, most of us would remember when President Obama foresaw the impact on American manufacturing and you had the pivot to South Asia. And, and that was his attempt at doing what Trump did later. But Trump has been much less nuanced on this front, but his push has put the US ahead. And Biden is unlikely to change that. So, you know, much more continuity on that front. And in fact, I think the two differ much less on other issues such as uh, counterterrorism. And there perhaps is a scope of bipartisan foreign policy when you're talking about that. From the rest of world perspective, Trump's, let's call it reluctance or reticence to use military force has been, well, a relief of sorts for a lot of us, uh, even compared to Obama years, other than punishing strikes in Syria, the killing of Iranian um, General Soleimani. And the United States has been much less interventionist under Trump than it has been in the past. And uh, he has also avoided uh, criticizing regimes on human rights records or internal policies, uh, which has been good news for countries such as India, say for recently, who have not been questioned on the human rights records recently. So 
I think those are the broad areas where the Trump and the Biden administration will differ. Mm -hmm. I'd say I'd say that kind of is a reflection within uh, most of the Sri Lankan population, at least. Um, people think that you know a Trump administration might have been maybe good for Sri Lankan administrations um, when it comes to you know issues like human rights and whatnot. Um, so bring it home, Pratish. How do you? What does what does a new Biden Harris administration could mean for South Asia? Do you think uh, things might change from from the Trump era, the building up from you know relations with good relations with uh, with with Prime Minister Modi, and of course good relations with Sri Lanka and South Asia? How do you think things could change for relations with Pakistan, with India, and with Sri Lanka and the Indian Ocean? With you know China looming and China also flexing its muscles in in the Indian Ocean. So, you know, first up, I think uh, another point, and just to close my first answer, is the fact that Biden is a much more seasoned international politician than I would go on a limb and say than any other American president in the past. Like you know, since twenty seven years, you know, he's been in the Senate. He's being chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee twice. Uh, in fact, I think in 2006, when India and um, the US signed their nuclear, civil nuclear cooperation deal, he was in chair, you know, he was a chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So he definitely has the experience. And he understands the region, he understands the issues, he has personal relations with a lot of global leaders. So there is that that he has going for him. He also has a well-articulated vision of what he wants. You know, we have seen it in articles in Foreign Affairs. He's put it up on his campaign website. So we have, we hope, you know, there's a lot more predictability with the Biden administration. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, we have that structure that, you know, what he's likely to expect from these countries going forward. Of course, but, of course. I mean, my own... So, and of course, I, I want to emphasize that, you know, nobody can predict the future. And in this time, yeah. we're just gone to Pratisha's head to tell you what you think and 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 of course in in Washington DC and as like any other capital in the world there's so many forces that yeah, that are pulling you in one direction or the other direction so we're just uh weighing you know looking at pros and cons and where things might head at the end of the day well America we're looking at um national like you know self-interest or other values anyway over to you yeah so um... I mean, you make a fair point, like it is hard. So I, I think that the Biden administration shorn of its rhetoric that it has raised on, you know, there's been some concern in South Asia that uh, Biden and uh, even his running mate Kamala Harris, they you know, they raise issues of human rights and, uh, you know, things that we've come to consider as internal policy matters and something that the Trump administration was, you know, very hands off about. I think shorn of rhetoric, I'm not very, you know, it's, it's not an entirely convincing argument that they are going to make the Volte first and talk to these countries and admonish them on, you know, you know, what seems to be their internal policy matters because of the influence of China in the region. And, you know, look at Maldives, look at Sri Lanka, look at Nepal, look at Bangladesh. They do a lot more trade with China than, you know, they do with any other part. So any other part of the world. And you know, they, they are the cusp or you know, they're sitting on the border of that line where a nudge is going to push them in one camp at the moment. So I, I'm not sure the US as it tries to pivot to a new strategy in South Asia is going to risk going out on a limb and uh, you know, so as to say scold countries and leaders on you know, what seems to be questionable internal policies. So I would be surprised if uh, they were less pragmatic than that and going ahead you know, we are unlikely to see much change on that front. In terms of their own understanding and, you know, how they view South Asia, their vision sort of revolves around these three pillars, which is, uh, you know, strengthening democracies. And, and I really hope that in the past, when the US has spoken about strengthening democracies, they have really taken off the velvet glove. So, you know, we hope it is not a reversion, revision back to a liberal interventionist agenda. And I don't think Biden comes from, you know, that school of thought also. But so, you know, I, I think engagement is going to continue the way it has. They understand the relevance of Pakistan, like you said. So, you know, with the U.S. pulling out from Afghanistan, Pakistan's primacy, Pakistan's role, 
And I think that relationship is going to deepen. They, I, I think both Biden and Harris understand the role of India, you know, maybe questionable internal decisions. You could hear some statements on that, but they're likely to continue with the relationship that Trump built, which was a very good relationship for both countries. India got to do what it wanted to do with the support of, uh, you know, the US. And given the border tensions between India and China, I think India is shifting more clearly into the US camp. So, you know, I, I think that will continue. Countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, which have voiced some sort of, you know, concern about, uh, you know, they faced charges from the US in the, you know, in the past about human rights violations. I, I don't think that is going to come back. I think, I mean, a lot of these things will continue as they are because the Biden had his administration has these large priorities where they want to build international coalitions on issues such as climate change, move ahead with the world as it is. So they're going to leave things as they are in some areas and in other areas, perhaps deep in cooperation. So, I mean, I, I think on the whole, it should be very good for South Asia. Uh, I mean, at the moment, I'm less inclined to believe people who say that, um, you know, maybe it's a hark back to, um, you know, a pre-Obama era or, you know, Obama's first term where you got a lot of uh, dictation from Washington DC about how we should do what we do. Um, tell us, tell us about, um, you know, domestic factors that's been uh, going about in America and, you know, Professor Kiravala and I were di discussing a few minutes ago about, you know, how, um, even though a Biden administration seems to have won uh, the next, um, will become the next um, administration. It seems like um, President Trump got, you know, a fair amount of um, votes and it was a close election. Sometimes some, one could say it was a pretty close election. And and on, on the one hand, the Trumpism camp has very different values. Um, they have taken the United States out of the World Health Organization during the time of the pandemic. Uh, they've taken the United States out of the Paris climate change accord. So very isolationist agenda away from global institutions. And I'd say there's probably a lot of debate whether you know global institutions are working anymore, whether the United Nations is an effective institution, whether, uh, whether the World Health Organization was effective in preventing or even you know solving the pandemic at all. Do you see there could be some domestic opposition and especially given the fact that if uh, the U.S. Senate, um, if the Republicans win majority in the U.S. Senate, that Biden, um, President Biden might have certain, um, you know, obstacles in really getting uh, America back with the world and connecting with um, global institutions. Yeah, so, you, so, so there, you know, let me structure this answer in three parts. The first is about the internal politics. So if you believe Trump, the election isn't over, right? Like, I mean, let's see where this ends, according to him. So my, I mean, if you speak to people in Washington, D.C., the feeling is that um, while the manner in which Trump has done what he's done by, you know, withdrawing from the WHO or, uh, you know, the Paris Agreement and things like that, there was a grain of truth in a lot of the points he raised. So, uh, I mean, there was an article I remember, I, I think it was the New York Times that spoke about the, the problem with Trump's foreign policy is not bravado, it is naivety. It is simply that, you know, he saw things as they are and, you know, he questioned whether we could change and he did away with the diplomatic traditions and niceties, but, you know, he was faced with the ugly truth that there are certain problems in international relations. And he may have amplified that, like, you look, the WHO, for all, all its ills has been, uh, you know, it's been fantastic for the world. I think it was the first global effort, you know, when we eradicated things like smallpox and WHO was very instrumental in that. So I think it was a matter of throwing the baby with the bathwater. I mean, a call to changing uh, institutions or demanding reform was very different from what Trump did. You know, Trump outright went at it with a sledgehammer. I think, but what he has done by doing that is that he has shown that this can be done. Like there was a reluctance and there was sort of a complacency in the world, which people thought that, you know, these institutions cannot be touched, nothing can happen and, you know, things are the way they are. So Trump did reveal that, you know, what people thought about, maybe discussed in, you know, drawing room conversations 
is that, you know, you know, why are we paying for security to Germany? You know, why, why are we funding NATO? Or uh, why are we funding um, poverty eradication programs? You know, we have enough poor at home. So he sort of voiced these issues in a manner. And I think from where he's brought that discourse, it will be hard to just cycle back. Some things are very obvious, this, I mean, some things like, uh, I mean, because Biden has made it, has articulated this very clearly, is that, you know, re-entering the Paris Accord or strengthening a global um, health organization are things that, you know, this administration is going to look to do. And Trump has, and Biden has called himself, an, you know, a president who is concerned about the environment. So I definitely see a move in that direction. And I think because you know, joining the Paris Accord was an executive action. It didn't have to pass through. So I think those things are also achievable for Biden to do. And there's some sort of support. On other things, he may find it much harder. I think you can have bipartisan support on issues such as, um, you know, cyber terrorism or, uh, or, or even the China policy will have bipartisan support within the US because I think Biden is going to continue to push that. But on other issues, I, I think... And Biden is likely to continue with that in the initial few days. I don't think uh, uh, this election or this mandate has convinced anyone about, you know, where American public opinion stands on these issues. So a president that will go, you know, full sail against, you know, the win, I, I think will be difficult for him to do. And, I, and Biden's been in international relations for so long that he has a clear understanding of, you know, beating the, the way the wind blows. So... Not much on that front. I, I don't think uh, there are large areas of cooperation, such as cyber terrorism and uh, China policy, or even environment and climate change to some extent. On others, I, I think it will be hard for him to, you know, undo what Trump has done. And I'm not sure he really wants to undo what Trump has done because mm -hmm. the manner in which Trump did it may be questionable, but it has put America in a stronger negotiating position in a lot of arguments. So, yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think he ha he has enough support to do that, to do these things about um, the mm -hmm. World Health Organization or, you know, climate change. I think I think it's a great point, like, you know, you know, finishing where President Trump's administration has ended. And like, it's a great pivot to international institutions and, and maybe a great pivot to our next question. And, and before we move forward, I want to, I want to, um, you know, say to the audience, if you have any questions, uh, if you're joining on Zoom, please feel free to type your questions here so that our panelists can see. And, and if you're joining on Facebook, please um, type your question as a comment. So we want this to be as, you know, as participatory as possible. We will soon be open it up to, to all of you. Uh, so maybe let's like one last question for between you and me. Um, so pivoting from, you know, question from to the next one. Um, Tell us, how do you see, and, and again, this is, again, a lot of predictions and assuming a lot of things. How do you see the next um, Biden administration or a Biden president changing um, US-China relations after the Trump era? And, and with respect to international institutions, like if you, if you could be you know, adjusting or coming up with new global governance institutions, it's unrealistic not to have China in, in the discussion. But then again, if, if President Biden will continue a very, um, let's just put it mildly saying, not so friendly approach with, uh, with the rising giant of Asia, um, then if that's the case, do you think uh, a Biden administration will continue to strengthen global institutions as they are today? How do you think uh, a US and China relationship will shape uh, the next four years of international politics in, in, in Asia? So, you, you know, let me take the easier question first about global institutions. I, mean, I know that's a lot of, that is a lot of uh, questions together. No, I, but, but, you know, this is an easy answer. So the US approach, whether Trump or the Obama era to global institution has been America first. And that's not going to change. Like, I think, uh, America has, a, has had a hard time adjusting to a world that is uh, multipolar in terms of economy, in terms of economic power, but is still unipolar in terms of, you know, military might. So that's the world we live in, you know, and I think America is not, is unlikely to cede 
its leadership in most of these organizations, at least voluntarily. So a lot of pushback even when it comes to the World Health Organization has come because the leadership voting rights has moved away from, you know, America's sort of backyard, you know, uh, or American candidates. So that, that has been a thing. And I, I don't think, I mean, this is a much larger debate that's been ongoing and where it stands today is in the last 10 or 15 years, despite the rise of China, despite the rise of these, you know, other powers in the world, aspirational powers, America is very reluctant to, you know, uh, cede authority, you know, where it can, and, and it has been fighting tooth and nail. So I, I think even under Biden, I don't think this is going to change. You're not going to suddenly see cooperation on new areas such as climate change. I think that is an opportunity and that may also be a necessity for America to start cooperating. You cannot talk of climate change by ignoring China or ignoring India. In those institutions, I think that is one area where uh, you know even rivals could come together on a platform and chart a course forward because this is this is you know very important for Biden and for it to work really he will have to build some sort of bridges with China so on global institution cooperation on that front I think climate change is perhaps the thing that you know that we could look at new leadership in existing institutions it is a battle that America is unlikely to you know relent upon so I, I think that will continue okay. about South Asia China and the US. So I think the US policy in South Asia is, has to be premised on what China means to South Asia. And that is how the US is seeing South Asia at the moment. Um, so in terms of the China US relationship, there's been a lot of literature, there's been, I've been speaking to people uh, who could perhaps have a role in the new administration and who are at least a part of the Obama era administration, and some who left you know, the Trump administration in between. And the general perception is Trump has done good on China from an American perspective. Like, uh, and that is not going to change even, you know, under Biden. I, I think Biden will find it really hard to backpedal America's position. I don't think they're really interested. The way the US sees it is they're winning the war of perception. They're winning the war on many of these fronts. So cycling back on or relentless pressure on China is something that's going to continue. And I, I think Biden would be more than happy to do that. The way China plays in South Asia is the influence it really commands in countries such as Nepal or Bangladesh or even India. And, and you can see that geography really come into America's foreign policy with South Asia. South China, the US also views countries in South Asia, you know, vis-a-vis -vis their context with China. And, and that has pre, you know, that has come into the foreground much and much more in recent years, especially the way, you know, when um, India and the US closing up or, you know, its relations with other countries in the region. So China is a, is, is a core part of the US foreign policy. Biden is unlikely to change how the US has been dealing with China, is going to continue to maintain that pressure. The only hope we have is that it's going to be a lot more predictable. Under Trump, there was this element of unpredictability, you know, that, that sort of kept the world on tenterhooks. With Biden coming in, him articulating this vision that I'm going to continue with pressure on China, but the way I'm going to do this is through a broad coalition of countries, you know, through transparency. And if you take him on his word, then, you know, hopefully there'll be a lot more transparency and predictability in US-China relations, which will be good for South Asia as well. Mm -hmm. I think at this point, even, even China could be welcoming more transparency and more consistency in U.S. foreign policy uh, in, in the next few years. So maybe without, you know, waiting any longer, why don't we open this up to, up to our panel and anybody else listening? Uh, do we have any immediate comments from panel? Maybe Professor Kiravala, would you like to? Yes, Professor. Yes. When we, yeah. Can you hear me? Professor, yes, Professor Kiravala was the Deputy Chief of Mission in Washington, D.C., the Sri Lankan Embassy. So we're grateful to have you, Professor. I would like you to introduce me, not, uh, you know, as the, for the, my university pro, pro, position. Yes. Okay. <laughs> when we talk of U.S. South Asian policy, first question comes to my mind is that whether you, United States has a South Asian policy. Whether 
uh, you know, they have the relation, bilateral relations with South Asian countries. That does not mean uh, the South Asian policy. They always, I, you know, in order to explain this question, they look at South Asian issues from the lens of now Indian Ocean uh, strategic. They are, they are the attitude, the, the policy towards the Indian Ocean. The South Asian policy is not Indian policy. South Asia is not India. You know, therefore, in the stark reality is even the United States didn't have clear cut policy towards the Indian Ocean also. They are reacting according to the from very beginning. They are reacting to the developments in the Indian Ocean, in the developments in the Indian Ocean region without a clear cut strategic vision or policy. In this situation, Right now, they think that Indian Ocean is very important because the United States' main question, main foreign policy question right now is how to deal with Russia, uh, uh, deal with China, how to deal with, how to address the emerging China. That is the key issue. Indian Ocean policy also viewed from the perspective from that strategy and United South Asian policy was viewed in the lenses of their at it, they are uh, the policy towards the Indian Ocean. In this situation, certain, you know, for example, your political realities in South Asia, you know, relationship between India and other states, various other dynamics in South Asia has not taken into account. That will have very serious implications on uh, US policy. In this situation, how can we talk of a uh, U.S. policy towards South Asia. Okay, great question, Professor. Pratish, do you wanna? Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, that that is a great question, and, and I think that is a question. So, to begin with, uh, Professor, I mean, the idea is that uh, I I sort of try to generalize the way the U.S. views South Asia, and, and yeah, that's a great question whether whether the U.S. views South Asia is one component or, and, you know, sort of generalizes the differences that exist, a heterogeneity within that region. And uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the way the US has viewed South Asia or, you know, the subcontinent and the countries outside the subcontinent as one has always been in relation to something. I mean, uh, you know, going back in the past, it was, uh, you know, it, it was the proximity that uh, large, large countries in this area had to the Soviet Union going forward from there it has been you know the role they have had in combating uh, you know the the rise of extremism in in the region and now it is of course the way they view is the perspective of the influence of china in that region and you know what role it can have in curtailing chinese influence in that region so i mean you're you're absolutely right in saying that whether the us has a south asia policy in general is a is a very good question but what generalization helps us do in this conversation with about Biden's view towards South Asia is, you know, if you take a, a much more elevated view of, uh, you know, the way they're going to see this region, they will continue the way you have said is look at the influence of China in this region and countries that can really counter that. And their local policies in the past have, you know, their policy in the past towards countries in this region has always been in context of you know, giant powers and, you know, of their own self-interest. And I don't, and you're right, like that's not going to change. I mean, India is definitely not South Asia and uh, a more nuanced understanding of international relations would mean that they should look at these countries and deal with them separately. But, uh, you know, unfortunately for the US, I think in the last 20 years, it has been in the context of something. And that's something that right now remains to be China. Yes, so, and I think... Professor's question is coming from the realist school of thought, you know, we're thinking countries have their self-interests and, and I think there's a lot of talk in Washington DC, how can we move away or maybe maybe act in the self-interest of countries to tackle climate change and tackling a global pandemic and if countries start thinking from a self-interest perspective, it's very unlikely that we are going to you know, start coming up with a solution to the, the pandemic right now, or even countries wouldn't even start distributing uh, vaccines that they develop to other countries because it's not in their self-interest to distribute it to the other country. But but I think, you know, hopefully, hopefully people will come together 
to you know look beyond um, mere self-interest because it's in their self-interest maybe to look at a global community. Sorry, Pratush, I cut you off there. No, I, I mean, I, I think I made my, uh, you know, okay. I don't think it was answering the professor, but adding to that idea that the US sees South Asia in context of big powers and it tends to generalize these borders and uh, you know, the heterogeneity that exists within this region. And exactly. uh, unfortunately right now, you know, there is China and the US continues to see us in that perspective mm -hmm. as counterweights or as elements yeah. of its grander strategy with China. Yes, yes. Certainly. Uh, <clears throat> yes. My issue really here is from the United States point of view, they should they should address unpack the issue why other south asian countries not india countries around india have soft corner for south uh, for china without under addressing that thing it it, it will not be able to uh, you know pursue us strategy why, for example, Sri Lanka uh, is you know drifting towards China, you know it had some you know soft corners, you know. Therefore, it cannot be simply explained in terms of internal, simply internal di dynamics. Also, we have to take into consideration South South Asian strategic issues also especially power constitution in South Asia, that type of thing. You know, that's the, my point, really. You know, it's, it's a point that's well taken, Professor Karavala. The, you, yeah. know, that, uh, you know, at some stage, the US needs to unpack this and then, you know, perhaps address individual considerations. And I have no difference of opinion on that point of view. And I, I think most of us who have studied international relations understand that from, you know, from a from a perspective that that is something the US needs to do when it needs to understand the drift in countries. Unfortunately, I think in DC or the way the US has its priorities at this stage and in the hierarchy of the things that they are unpacking, they, need, they, they do tend to club the region together and look at the dynamics within it, you know, the way uh, in, a, in a much less you know, under a lens that is not as intense. And for their perspectives, I, I think it helps them generalize the way they look. I mean, is this a right policy? Of course not. And uh, is this a policy that they need to change going forward? Sure. But I, I think Biden and administrations, you know, the Biden administration is positioned to find itself going forward. I think just for the while, it's, I mean, they're going to continue with, you know, this these broad generalizations and, you know, individually deepening relations with countries, understanding the power dynamics between them and addressing this question of a drift towards China. But I think they, they see this in a perspective of a lot more immediacy that uh, you know, they break it down into cross constituents of economic interests or, uh, you know, and, and like you pointed out, internal dynamics more than you know, a, lo a longer cultural sort of affinity or you know, a sense in which these countries find themselves more comfortable dealing with China than with the US. And, and that's absolutely true. But I, I don't think you'll find your answer in the Biden administration, at least at the moment. I think mm -hmm. yeah. uh, be occupied. I agree, agree with you. Yes, yes. Thank you, Professor. Um, um, let's maybe come back to that later, shall we? Um, so let me give the stage to Nilan, who's also joining with us. Nilan, do you want to ask the question yourself? He's had, he's raised uh, at least two questions. Um, um maybe good questions uh, hi, yeah, that Nilan. was just one question that was just one question on the facebook group i just had a small question because i was following this very interesting discussion so it was for mr dube so uh, uh, mr dube seemed to say that uh, he wasn't sure whether biden would uh, came from an interventionist school of thought or that it was maybe a little unlikely that he came from a from an interventionist school of thought but when I look at his record, uh, he seems to be very much the personification of the Washington interventionist uh, school of thought. He was in favor of the Iraq war. He tried very hard to then shift the base of operations to the Afghan-Pakistan border. He was even in favor of uh, intervention in places like uh, Sudan. In the 80s, when he was championing himself 
as the kind of uh, hero of the war on drugs. He was critical of Ronald Reagan for not being interventionist enough. And uh, even very recently, uh, sort of he's made so many statements that justify that. So given, given his track record, uh, is it not uh, sort of, is it not obvious that uh, for 45 years, he's been essentially the personification of uh, Washington's interventionist uh, school of thought? Mm -hmm. well, thank that, you. Uh, let, me, let me just say, I mean, we are all mortals here trying to understand what's going to happen. So this, we want to make this as a debate and a discussion as much as possible. And nobody has the answer. So over to you, Pratish. Just a question. Oh, that's no, it. I'm going now. Okay. Actually, okay. I, I mean, I, I really like that question because Nilan touches points that most people, you know, if you read newspapers, you know about Biden. I mean, none of this is a surprise. In 92, he was, in the early 90s, he was against intervention in, uh, you know, to oust. He was against Operation Desert Storm, but then in 2003, he was full gung-ho about invading Iraq. In fact, in 2006, I think he wrote a much, he co-authored a much criticized uh, op-ed about dividing Iraq up into Shiite Kurdish regions. I mean, so, I mean, then he's had, he's had that, he comes from that time, sure. But, but what I meant about interventionism is, I don't think the Biden administration is going to go back to a liberal interventionist agenda that existed in sort of the first part of Obama's, um, the first Obama administration. And the reason is that the world has changed and the world has seen, and the US itself has seen something that, you know, that, that, that and Trump has done this for the US is to show that you can have a, non-interventionist agenda. And I think there's very little tolerance within the US right now for engaging in new conflicts. And given the mandate that Biden has had, which is why most people in, you know, in, the, in conversing about Biden foreign policy or the way he's articulated it um, in his article in Foreign Affairs or on his website, is that he has steered away. He speaks about building a coalition of democracies, strengthening democracies, his tone and tenor from his actions in the past have definitely changed. And we hope he's, you know, he's come to see the error of his interventionist ways. And even if he hasn't, I think the timing in the US prevents him from taking us back to a, you know, to an era where the US was very free with, uh, you know, who it could dictate to and, uh, and the manner of choosing in which they did that. So I, I think that is where I came. And I'm, what I want, the point I was trying to make was, that Biden is no longer, you know, the Biden administration no longer subscribes to that school. At least that's the noises they're making. That is the selection of their, uh, you know, members from the Obama administration or even new or potential members in the Biden administration. They are not people who would speak very happily about uh, intervening in countries, which is why, you know, it, it goes to the point that are they going to, you know, lecture countries about human rights? Maybe they made those noises during the election, but shown of the rhetoric of it. I don't think so. We're going to see a lot of that on that front. I think they have large internal priorities to deal with, and uh, they're not going to change foreign policy in a way, in a significant way, or uh, revert the American position from where it has been in the last four years, at least in terms of interventions. I hope that answers your question, uh, Nilan. Or, yeah, sure. Know, because my 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 I think I think that's a completely fair point, and I think I I, I agree with that uh, uh, almost in totality. My only worry came when I saw the way John Bolton was treated a few months ago. John Bolton, the architect of almost every single U.S. military intervention over the last fifteen years, he writes a book saying he hates Trump because Trump did not let him bomb Iran. And the entire mainstream media, all of them, including the sort of political Democrat wing, they celebrated John Bolton for saying that. They celebrated John Bolton for saying, I hate Trump for not letting me bomb Iran. So my only worry is that uh, this mentality of uh, sort of we don't want interventions anymore, we don't really want to be gung-ho anymore. Uh, once Trump, because since the... In the last four years, let's face it, the discourse has been entirely controlled by Trump. If Trump says the sky is blue, half the country seems to say, yes, the sky is blue. And another half says it's racist to say the sky is blue. So once he's gone out of the picture, 
if we go back to celebrating these guys simply because they take up an anti-populist uh, position like John Bolton was, uh, I'm a little worried that we would just go back to the days of intervention because uh, if someone sticks it to Trump saying, oh, haha, Trump doesn't want us to invade Iran, but I want to invade Iran, I can see all the late night comedians and the uh, uh, sort of uh, CNN, MSNBC uh, reporters, all the Ivy League intellectuals, all of them now jumping on the let's uh, bomb Iran bandwagon because Trump doesn't want that. That's my only worry. Based on the way that I saw John Bolton treated like a celebrity just mm -hmm. a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and just let me just add to that point. I, I think, I mean, Nilam makes a great point there, but you can't blame politicians for doing politics. And I think Bolton was the result of an anti, you know, of, of the political climate here, of the Trump campaign. Uh, and anyone who said anything against Trump, you know, was perhaps celebrated by the opposition. And that is, I, I think, where Bolton's hero status came, for, uh, came from. But uh, I mean, just in terms of Iran or just in terms of, uh, you know, Biden's stated policy on these issues is that they would like to go back to the negotiating table. Like these are things that were considered achievements under the Obama administration. Biden was a very important part of it. Uh, I, I do, you know, I share Nilan's concern that uh, that there are people in this administration with a legacy, with a history of uh, having an interventionist agenda or who saw the world in that view. Uh, I, I'm less worried at the moment that, uh, I mean, I share his concern, but I'm less worried at the moment that uh, Bolton was a symptom of a larger malaise that, uh, Upping Trump on this could perhaps lead the world into, you know, a more, or could perhaps have a more interventionist the United States. I, I don't think that revision is going to come about very immediately because they have uh, strong domestic constraints on it. And uh, Biden's position on these issues has been clear that they would like to go back to the negotiating table. They'd like to bring these countries. They'd like to build on the successes of the Obama administration, so as to say, uh, and not just, you know, tr you know, Trump, Trump, so as to speak. Mm -hmm. I think this comes back from, you know, during the last days of the Obama administration, as we, we have the chat yesterday, how President Obama had also, you know, moved focus away from Middle East and other areas to Asia, and like Obama's pivot to Asia was one of those policies. And I think there's an awakening in maybe Washington, D.C., and don't quote me on this, I think that that America needs to tackle head on the big challenge that America will face, which is, which is the rise of China, as opposed to um, spending political capital and military expenses in, in, in rest of the world. And I think maybe that's, that's like a sane awakening, which is maybe a positive or could be a negative development. Uh, so there's another question from um, from Dakshita, and this is a very specific question he's asking. And I, I don't know, like maybe anyone on the panel could, you know, take up this question. He's asking, would a Biden Harris administration? What would it mean? Uh, will there be no global gag rule? And I and I just Google global gag rule just to be sure that I don't. <laughs> so a global gag rule is, I think, when. Uh, U.S. Um, assistance, healthcare assistance goes to developing countries with you know, global institutions. Maybe the, a global gag rule is a rule saying that countries with legal abortion policies will not receive assistance or will get less assistance. Um, do you want to make a comment on that, Pratush? I mean, so, yeah, I mean, this was sort of a worrying trend, you know, within the Trump administration that they chose to impose something like this and uh, that, and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, but without a value judgment, I do think that the Biden-Harris administration, I mean, again, don't quote me on this, I'm not in, entirely sure when, but uh, I, I think they have been asked this question in press conferences and they're very clear about this, that that is a policy of the US that we're going to, you know, obviously revert because that's our political standards you know, doesn't merge with what the Trumpian view was on this. And uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think you're going to see a difference between the two administrations on this front, or at least one hopes and uh, a reversion back to the normal rather than mm -hmm. this you know, Trump with an aberration on this front. Yes, hopefully, hopefully. I think I think this goes back to, again, the, the domestic values question. Foreign policy starts with domestic values. And, and obviously, Democrats are big proponents of Planned Parenthood um, women's choice to choose 
Um, and, and let me just suggest if, if our panel and attendees have any questions, just type it up as a comment. Um, so um, maybe we can go on to the comment up about, you know, the question about China. And let me just slowly give you this ball, the same question that was asked by Ambassador Shiva Shankar Menon, um, maybe like a few months ago. And, and somebody asked him, you know, we often hear that uh, the Chinese are great strategists coming from the art of war for Sun Tzu, a lot of, you know, great strategists, but, but do you see a grand strategy, a great strategy for, for Chinese actions, China's foreign policy with, you know, China's immediate neighbors or maybe in South China Sea, or maybe with you know recent conflicts with on on the Indian border, do you see a grand strategy, or is it just you know domestic factors and local politics? Over to you. Um, so, so I mean that that is a great question, <laughs> and in fact, I think that can be a topic of an entirely different conversation altogether. But um, in a nutshell, uh, and Tisha, you would know this. I I think the obsession with sort of a Chinese grand strategy is a lot more prominent in Western academia than it's in anywhere, um, any other part of the world. Like I, I think uh, you could go into a bookstore in DC and the number of books on grand strategies, so as to say, and the detail with which the American academic enterprise uh, studies and examines this question uh, is, uh, is much more an American concern. I, uh, I mean, I, if China has a grand strategy, it, it has so because of its uh, governance structure lends itself to longer term thinking. It has the flexibility and the ability to plan longer term and implement those plans longer term. Uh, insofar, if that is what grand strategy refers to, that they have a that you know that they have a vision of the world and they can work towards it, I think that should apply to most countries around in the world. If you don't have a grand strategy, you should have one to sort of you know secure your place in the world. Um, I don't think it is unique to China, though. I mean, outside that, I, I don't think there's strategists inside China who burn the midnight candle and you know watch it uh, watch the light go out of it as they worry about US grand strategy in the region i think china has constraints and i agree with Pro you know ambassador shushankar menon on this is that china has real constraints domestic political constraints like any other country i mean the chinese are as um, politically um, aware as as any other nation in the world it uh, and uh, I mean, it should be a telling number that in the last three years, China has spent more on its internal security than on its, you know, its military is that there are concerns within China about uh, policing the people, about managing uh, its own population and, and, and internal constraints that are coming about. So to view Chinese grand strategy as something esoteric or something that is, uh, you know, is, is a vision of the world that is only ruled and commanded by China. I think it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's being a little premature and it's, it's a little, it's a very black and white understanding of the world is that you, know, you have an American vision and you have a Chinese vision and there's nothing in between. I think uh, most people in South Asia understand and we view the Chinese strategy so as to say very differently. Like, you know, we, mm -hmm. we see cooperation where there is scope of it. We see foreign policy uh, happening in sectors and in pieces, you know, where you can have a conversation about one issue while, you know, you can be, uh, you know, if you don't want, you won't, will not cooperate on any other issue. So I, I think my belief is, and my understanding comes more from that, is that the, the Chinese grand strategy is, exists, but insofar as of most countries in the world, but I think the American obsession with the Chinese grand strategy is, uh, is a little, uh, you know, is, is an American creation. And you mm. don't often hear about this outside the borders of uh, in North America. I'd say that's a very, very interesting observation. And might I add that, you know, a lot of my colleagues in Sri Lanka think that, you know, because because um, there's more stability or because China is an authoritarian regime, they can plan long-term, maybe maybe not just the five-year plans, but maybe for the next 30 years, the 50 years. And what you are saying is that it might not be so. And, and maybe maybe we might go to some of the theories that you know the academics in Washington DC have put out, the, the theory of fragmented authoritarianism, if I got it right, or 
fractured authoritarianism. Um, that's an interesting wave. Um, yeah, Nilan. Nilan seems to be having a comment, so why don't we give uh, the floor to Nilan? Yes, Nilan, over to you. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add uh, a sort of uh, one more point to why I think many of these uh, Western scholars have this uh, obsession with uh, China having some kind of grand strategy is because if you look at uh, the way uh, strategic uh, studies is taught in most parts of the West, they are very ignorant about what happens outside of their own historical way of thinking about strategy. And the only example that most of them can cite is the art of war by Sun Tzu. A, a, a small majority of them might know about the Arthashastra, right? A small majority of them might know Kautilya, but largely, if you, I, I, at least in my own experience, when I deal with uh, students and scholars in security and strategy from the West, largely, their only sort of uh, claim to having an international mindset is uh, Sun Tzu, right? Uh, and, and therefore, there seems to be this big myth that the Chinese are a very strategic people and that uh, everything that they do is a giant game of chess and all that. They seem to forget that all of these heads of state of China all have their own personal projects. Mao had his own personal project and now she has the Belt and Road Initiative as his kind of... Uh, personal project, uh, which are linked to their own legacy and how they see themselves being uh, remembered by history and all that. And we kind of attribute all these things. I'm, I mean, and let's face it, like I was telling you the other day, uh, this uh, a big reason why they still quote uh, Sun Tzu is because they have no real contemporary military experience. They have no real modern military strategists who can lay down fundamental military strategic tenets for them. They simply don't have it, right? They're a country with uh, many, many big toys that have not really been tested in practice and uh, sort of the way that even recently in the Panjong uh, Valley, their confrontation with uh, India, the way that the Indians were able to just sneak up and mine that entire slope, the Chinese didn't see it coming at all. And now, forever now, a 1962 repeat is now impossible because the Chinese did not have enough doctrinal common sense to anticipate India mining, uh, sort of uh, placing landmines on that entire upward slope. So the way they thrashed India in 1962, uh, it's far likely to, it's far less likely to happen now, right? So, they have, so uh, this obsession with Chinese strategic thinking, I think is very misplaced. Even this whole idea that the Belt and Road Initiative is some masterful uh, uh, chess game which conquers the entire world. And all. listen, once one of these countries says, oh, sorry, we can't pay you back, the game's mm -hmm. over. What's China mm -hmm. going to do? Invade one of those countries? That would let all the others know that this was China's game uh, all along, right? China is playing a game of poker right now. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, because geopolitics is not looked at objectively, a lot of uh, scholars, I mean, I'm thankful that we're in a panel like this where we, we are, where we are all more or less objective and we can have this discussion, right? But I think we can all agree that academia in many parts of the world is now completely corrupted by a lack of objectivity where people can't even uh, see this. I mean, uh, I don't want to hijack the discussion, right? But uh, I just thought that was, a, that was an interesting uh, addition to what uh, Mr. Dubey was saying about the American obsession with uh, Chinese grand strategy. Yes, thank you. Thank you, for Nilan, for adding adding your comments. Maybe Pratush might have a response, a comment. I, I mean, it, it's not really a response. I mean, again, this is going off topic here, but so I, I mean, my large part, the point about Chinese grand strategy is that it exists. It is because of the political structure that they can have one. Is it unique and different from others in the world? only insofar as their ability to execute it is, as a concept, it is not entirely, you know, it is not very different and it's not very uh, worrying or, uh, or, or, you know, it, it's not something that we haven't seen before. My concern with is that at the same time, one wouldn't want to write at all. Like the Chinese do have a grand strategy and that they, and it's a strategy that seems to work insofar if it was meant to achieve you know whatever goals they, they think that they're achieving because they don't seem to have changed it in the past uh, you know despite american pressure in the last four years that strategy hasn't changed so they may have a strategy i be want to not write it off but at the same time i, I think 
I mean, there is a belief in, um, I mean, there is sort of this idea that the Chinese are not battle hardy, that they're not battle tested. And you see it in Western academic discussions as well, is that, uh, you know, like Nilam said, that they have these toys, but they don't know much to do about, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not very convinced that that's true, but again, that's a topic for a different discussion. I think the, the Chinese um, have achieved what they have after having carefully thought about it. I think toys in terms of the modern battlefield go a long way. It's, uh, I mean, it's no longer about just the bravery of the individual soldier. It has to be amplified by a lot of other factors. The Chinese are getting that right. And uh, I mean, insofar as you see the evolution of Chinese RAND strategy, I think it's moved way beyond Sun Tzu. I think Sun Tzu is a Western obsession with Chinese thinking. And uh, you know, even in our discussions privately and with uh, members of the strategic studies community in the West, we do know that you use it only as a sort of a headstone. And there's a lot more around the Chinese grand strategy and thinking that has evolved the border from modern concepts from throughout the world. So I, I think, I mean, that Nilan may, we may not be on the same page, but that's a discussion for a different day. To your question, I hope, I think both of us together have given a good comprehensive answer is that the worry about Chinese grand strategy as an insidious thought process or you know, this giant dogma of conquering over the world is a little, is a bit of an American uh, uh, creation. Uh, it has roots and elements of truth in it. Uh, mm -hmm. And we are seeing Chinese aggression, uh, you know, eke out in other parts of the world. So, you know, some of these fears are being realized, but I think we are a long way off and China is, I think we often make the mistake of looking upon China as a monolith, you know, where, you know, one button sets off this entire series of action. That's not true. It is the world's most populous country. Fragmented authoritarianism points to that idea that it's a way of making, you know, of uh, administering such a large country with diverse mm -hmm. opinion, with people who have their own thoughts. So I think that that is uh, sort of important to bear in mm -hmm. mind is uh, to understand, take cognizance of the fact that there is a grand strategy, but mm -hmm. not to be obsessed over it. Yeah, exactly. I think Professor Gamani has. Uh, yes, Professor, over to you. Yeah, I think we have to uh, understand the difference between grand strategy and global policy. As a great power, emerging great power, China has a has its own uh, global strategy. That does not mean they have a grand strategy. Other thing, in order to understand, other, the second point I want to make is that in order to understand Chinese the policy, foreign policy, instead of paying attention to Chinese text we have to pay attention to three dynamics that propel Chinese foreign policy. Without understanding these three dynamics, we will not be able to understand foreign, Chinese foreign policy. First is military dynamics, political dynamics, and economic dynamics. You know, emerging of new economic enterprises and their relationship with the new political the dynamics, and the military dynamics. You know, all these dynamics has all the, the inherent contradictions and weaknesses. That is, those are the really, on the one hand, provenance of foreign policy. At the same time, those three dynamics were the chill seal of Chinese foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yes. Maybe final comments, Pratish, do you want to bring the discussion home to South Asia and our Sri Lankan audience and finish yeah, absolutely up? Absolutely no issue with uh, Professor Kirawala's uh, point. He's absolutely right. You have to look at the political dynamics. And I think that's the point that we were making is mm -hmm. that you have to understand Chinese policy in context of you know, what's happening domestically. And I think there's an awareness of that even in the West. It's, you know, China is no longer a black box that they don't understand. They do understand that. But I think the media narrative and the narrative that comes from the White House sometimes just juxtaposes it as uh, you know us versus them, and that sort of simplifies and puts it up in these neat blocks of Chinese grand strategy. And again, it's a great point that Prof. Kirawala makes that is that we tend to confound these very technical uh, international relations terms of strategy, grand strategy, and global policy, and it's easy to confuse the three because they sometimes sound the same, but 
it isn't. Uh, and that's not to say that China doesn't have a global policy. It does have a global policy. It also has a grand strategy, but don't conflate the two. And uh, you, you know, I, I think that's a great point, Prof. Kirawala. So thank you for making that. Yeah, in, in the end, uh, this is, uh, you know, just like four points and uh, about, you know, where we stand today. It's, uh, exactly. it's bring, it to, bring it home to South Asia for normal people, yeah, you so, know, you know journalist, why should, why should the average Sri Lankan, the average Indian care about this, you know, how, how it affects them? You know, we should care simply because America has an outsized role in our policies and in our politics and it is the world's preeminent power and we have to care and uh, if we care or we don't care, we are impacted by it. Right? So, you know, you should care because you are being impacted by it. Uh, you know, one point is that this Biden administration is likely, and, and I hope it will be different from the legacy it comes from. The liberal interventionist agenda that, uh, that you know, Biden grew up, sort of formulated his worldview in is, should, you know, will face real domestic constraints in the US right now. So hopefully we are not harking back to a time where, uh, you know, the pre-Trump era only in terms of a global interventionist uh, agenda. Second, the world faces common economic problems, common problems in terms of climate change. And I think it is uh, vital that this administration sort of resumes American leadership position in that because if you cannot talk about climate change without China or without the US. So I think, you know, we do need to care about this because South Asia is one of those areas that's been, you know, we face, we see climate change on our, in our daily lives. It's not an academic topic for us. We have land that's going, we have uh, landmass in Bangladesh going underwater. We have uh, erratic uh, uh, patterns of, uh, you know, farming now that, that farmers are, are facing real erratic environmental factors that are coming in. So for us, it's a reality. So again, hopefully this administration will go by what Biden has been saying. America will resume a position in climate change uh, discussions and you know that. Uh, the third point for South Asia is going forward, what do we expect between China and uh, the US? Uh, you know, there's been this nice dichotomy in Western media about a Cold War. And it, it sounds so nice because it gives us a point of reference to hark back to Soviet American relations. And so now we see the Chinese, the Sino American relations in the same context. Uh, I, I think looking a little bit beyond that, I think uh, the, the relations between China and US needs to evolve. And I think Biden perhaps is in a good position right now because what Trump has managed to do is give America the upper hand. And uh, this can be debated whether how, how much benefit America is getting out of these ongoing uh, you know, conflict with uh, China, but it seems like America definitely has a better hand, upper hand in terms of negotiation at the moment. And I think Biden is going to continue with it. There are areas where the cooperation will improve and climate change being one of them, a global health emergency like this. I think this is the first time after the second world war that a global health emergency has not seen American leadership. So, you know, and that was, it was like it or not like it, it was important. It helped coordinate a lot of resources for a lot of such global health campaigns. And I think it's important to get that back, you know, going ahead when we know that, that you know, that the world faces these crises. And finally, uh, you know, I, I think South Asia in itself is to group it as one region and, you know, one and not, and to ignore its internal dynamics and differences and to talk about it uh, as a general swath of, uh, you know, just a landmass and geography and talk club countries in this region like that is a mistake. And I think, uh, but I don't see the Biden administration rectifying that mistake anytime soon. Mm. And, uh, I, I, I think that's a longer thing. I think South Asia has its own issues to resolve before uh, the US gets to, uh, you know, have an opinion about uh, this mm. area. I think that's a, that's a great way to summarize our, our discussion, Pratyush. Uh, this has been a great lively discussion and debate. And thank you so much for you know accepting our invitation, Pratyush. And thank you for Professor Kiravel and Nila and, and, and everybody who participated and asked questions. Um, this has been very lively. Um, you know, I, I hope you know, we can we can hopefully have you again in our discussions, Pratyush and Professor Kiravel in the future. Um, and this is an evolving discussion and maybe 
uh, we might have a better sense of what's going to happen after January 20th, uh, 2021 and what might go on. Until then, stay safe and everyone stay safe inside. Uh, there's a big pandemic going on. Um, yes, and, and, and keep in touch. And we want to, the policy.lk community to grow and keep debating all these important issues. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Pratush. Yeah. Uh, just uh, best of luck. It's a great platform. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Kirawala. It was, uh, you know, good to get to know you and uh, Nilan because, you know, yeah, he brings a different perspective to this discussion. And, and you know, let's, let's schedule a discussion one year from now. Let's see mm -hmm. how the Biden administration actually comes, uh, you know, how close we were to reading the tea leaves. That's a great idea. Have, Thank you very much. It is, less, it is very interesting to listen to you. Right. Take care. Thank you. Take care.